It is currently 7.30 a.m. and we are speed walking through the streets of Oslo. I'm a bit nervous, but uh, I think things are yeah, coming into place now. I guess we'll see how today goes. Why are we doing it so early in the morning? We want uh, like people that are going to work to see it now. Also, it's not technically legal to <laughs> put it on, on the Opera House. <laughs> the banner's down. How does it feel? Uh, great, yeah. We did it and security hasn't stopped us. Why are you against deep sea mining? The area that they want to open for deep sea mining is like one of this world's greatest mysteries. We almost know nothing about the area. Like we have to build Norway's economy on something sustainable. And that is definitely not deep sea mining. <laughs> Norway could become the first country in the world to mine the deep sea. Scientists and environmentalists fear that this might blow open the door for a new frontier of extraction, with companies and governments from the Arctic to the Pacific in a race to reap the riches of the ocean floor. The Norwegian parliament has a big vote coming up. It'll be deciding whether to open up a section of the Arctic Sea to deep sea mining, starting with exploration. The day before parliament opens its annual session, these young activists are making their voices heard. Right now, these protesters are gathering outside of Parliament. It's the day before Parliament opens, and Norway is the first country out of the South Pacific that is really pushing deep sea mining ahead. And it might be during this parliamentary session that they will approve exploratory and mining licenses. So a lot is at stake here. This is the high Arctic. It's already under severe pressure from climate change, from pollution. We really don't need an added stressor. It's interesting how Norway is sort of at the forefront of this issue that not a lot of people, not just in Norway, but around the world are thinking about. Mm. There's a lot at stake, actually, with this yeah. next parliament session. Under what's called the United Nations Law of the Sea, actually Norway and all countries that have signed this are obligated to manage the resources of our planet in the ocean for the benefit of, you know, you and me and all humankind, both current and future generations. That's a really big responsibility. But why mine the deep sea? Access to minerals like cobalt is critical for the green transition because they're used to make things like batteries for electric vehicles and solar panels. Some people think mining different parts of the deep sea, all the way down to 21,000 feet below, holds a solution and profits. Hydrothermal vents spew out magma-heated water, leaving mineral deposits. Sea mounts are sometimes covered with a cobalt-rich crust, which would have to be dug up. Finally, there are the abyssal plains, which cover half of the planet and are scattered with polymetallic nodules, ancient rocks made of minerals. Any type of mining would generate pollution from the light, noise, and wastewater, as well as create plumes of sediment. Scientists warn that we still don't know enough to make evidence-based decision-making on whether to proceed with mining. They say that most of the deep ocean is poorly characterized or understood or still completely unexplored, and that the consequences of the impacts of commercial mining remain unknown. They fear that mining the deep sea could cause significant damage to near pristine and important ecosystems on enormous scales, which could potentially lead to the extinction of rare, endemic, or unknown species. There could also be impacts to ecosystem services like fisheries, climate regulation, and carbon storage. Environmentalists say we could also reduce the demand for minerals by improving battery technologies and recycling minerals from old electronics. More than 20 countries have come out in support of a moratorium or outright ban on deep sea mining. And dozens of companies like Microsoft, Google, and BMW 
have promised they won't use deep sea minerals until it's clear that the environment can be effectively protected. Nevertheless, the International Seabed Authority has issued exploration licenses in international waters, though it's still deciding whether to go ahead with actual mining. And in the meantime, countries like Norway are paving the way in their own sovereign waters. The Norwegian parliament will be voting on a proposal put forward by the Ministry of Petroleum and Energy. We spoke to its state secretary about why it was going ahead despite objections from the government's environmental agency. What is the Norwegian government's stance on deep sea mining? We're going to need a lot of minerals going forward, given everything that we need to do with the green transition for decades to come. And one potential safe, reliable source of those minerals can perhaps be minerals from the deep seas. And therefore we have decided to propose to open an area also for private actors to be able to explore, look for, potentially in the future develop a resource extraction project so that we can look into the possible future of this industry. How does the Ministry of Oil and Energy reconcile the fact that another agency in the government has said that this assessment isn't good enough, which was the first hurdle that the Seabed Minerals Act had to overcome, right? There is, uh, and this is in, in good Norwegian tradition, uh, not always full agreement on what will be sufficient assessment to bring forward from the ministry point of view, we perceive uh, the current knowledge, especially on the limited effects of exploration activities, as far as you're not uh, allowing a lot of exploration activities. The energy crisis of the last two years, how much of that factored into this push right now for deep sea mining? One of the very important uh, effects uh, of the energy crisis is that it has sped up the transition uh, by many years, in particular from a European point of departure. There are uh, activities that are taken to transition the European energy system away from the dependency that it has had on uh, Russian uh, resources. Do you think these geopolitical concerns could potentially trump or at least, you know, pressure the, the environmental and scientific concerns? It is a different and difficult uh, and more dangerous global world that we live in today as compared to just a few years ago. Uh, but uh, uh, while those concerns are important and a motivation to go forward with looking into the potential that this industry could have, it will never be uh, more important than the safeguarding of our oceans. Norway grew rich on its oil and gas reserves generating one of the world's biggest sovereign wealth funds. Walter Songs worked in oil and gas before becoming the CEO of Lokim Marine Minerals, a Norwegian company that already has exploration licenses in the Pacific and is actively looking to mine in Norway. So you sort of see yourself as a pioneer in this yes. field? We've been pioneers in the oil and gas industries for decades. You think that makes Norwegian companies well-suited to do deep sea mining? One simple way of looking at it is that we have taken the oil and gas industry into the deep oceans, into the deep waters. We are off the peak oil production and we will be off peak gas production in a while. But at the same time, the green transition comes with a vast increase of metals, on minerals. And a huge part of those, the largest resources in the world, are on the seabed. And the only industry that can go down to four or five thousand meters is the oil and gas industry. And the best in the world is the Norwegian industry. We visited the deep sea ecology lab at the University of Bergen, where Dr. Pedro Ribeiro showed us species from the regions of the Arctic being proposed for mining. It's a glass sponge and it's like a little vase. So um, from how deep did this one come? This one. Uh, came from around 2,000 meters. Then. 2,000 meters, yes. and here it is in my hand. That's pretty cool. But we see them. Uh, we see them uh, deeper than that. We see them at at nearly 4,000 meters. So wh why is this important? Well, it, it, the sponges in general they are important because they they can actually influence the way that carbon circulates in the deep sea by filtering the the seawater and recovering part of the carbon that is actually not available. Oh. to other organisms in what we call the sponge loop. Could you say it captures carbon then? Yes, exactly, and assimilates carbon, and then it releases 
products uh, right. that are in, in themselves, they can be used by other organisms. We also find them in areas where manganese crusts occur. Where the mining might happen. Where the mining might happen. And these sponges, like you just said, are really important for the ecosystem. So, so they are ecosystem engineers. If there are sponges and sponge grounds on top of a manganese crust, I can't imagine there's a way of mining that crust without essentially destroying these habitats. No, I mean, uh, mineral extraction implies that whatever lives on top of the deposit is removed. So, so it's, manganese crusts are no exception. On the other side of the planet, another country sees Norway as a model for how extractive industries can transform a small fishing nation. The Cook Islands is a tiny island state in the middle of the South Pacific with fewer than 15,000 residents. The government's Seabed Minerals Authority has issued three deep sea mining exploration licenses in the hopes the industry may one day transform the economy. We spoke to Prime Minister Mark Brown, an ardent supporter of deep sea mining. So we have a resource base of 7 billion tons of these little rocks, which are these ones. Ah, look at that. So that's what a polymetallic nodule is. Is that an actual nodule? It's an actual oh, wow. nodule. It's, Never actually seen one. It's from about five to 6,000 meters depth in the ocean. Can I see the nodule? Mm. It's so round, a little cobalt nugget. Batteries in a rock. We've recognized the, the risks associated with the narrow economic base that we have particularly during the COVID uh, closure of our borders, where we went from a high-income country to a no-income country overnight. So diversification of the economy is really important for us, and our minerals, we see, will play a significant role in our ability to diversify. Do you think seabed mining will go ahead in the Cook <coughs> Islands? Well, again, it's, it's all dependent on the exploration phase. Because before you were talking about all the potential benefits mm -hmm. that seabed minerals could bring to the country, but it all depends on this exploration phase and the findings from that. So it's, it's a lot of hopes pinning on something that might not go ahead. Yeah, that's right. It, it's, it'll go ahead on the basis of good sound evidence and facts. And that's what we're pursuing now. So I'd say right now we're on a journey of discovery. Do you think that research conducted by companies that have a vested interest in mining go ahead can conduct research that can be trusted and is objective? Yes, certainly. I mean, uh, there is a methodology to science and research. And if you apply proper science and methodology, uh, then, and base it on evidence and facts, uh, then it's pretty indisputable you know, to call into question. In addition, uh, a lot of the studies that will be provided by the companies will be peer reviewed, independently peer reviewed, uh, so that the government is assured uh, that the work that's been done is appropriate, is relevant. In addition to leading the Apostolic Church, Bishop Tutaipere is the chair of the advisory committee for the Seabed Minerals Authority. The land we search is exceedingly good land, a land for the good milk and honey. Our God of Israel did not bring us here for nothing. Kokarest, the seabed is not there. Those mineral nodules is not there to be wasted. So choose here today. Make your choice. Defeated, gone, live in poverty, and die or follow with faith, Hallelujah. conquer, yeah. and reap the harvest of prosperity. Yeah. So you are the chair of the Seabed Mineral chair Authority Advisory, Advisory Council. Yes. Do you have a background in, in mining or engineering? Mm, not really. <laughs> But I have faith. You have faith. Yeah. In your sermon, I, I heard you mention how the nodules are packed so tightly together. There's so many that, that no life can exist down there. Yes. What do you mean by that? It takes a little sand, a little uh, 
sustainable corner uh, to stimulate life. But with all these rocks all gathered together, no life is available, especially it's covered for miles. So that answers to we're not destroying any uh, living organisms down there. So you think seabed mining will actually create more life down there? People are saying, what do you replace? What you've taken away? When we remove all these rocks, it's just like a wilderness and desolation. Life will come back because it's sand and organisms will find a way to settle. How do you know that? Where did you learn that? Common sense. Common sense. You believe that you're delivering the message that... Delivering. That because, seabed uh, mining is we, something they should have faith we, in. Like I said, it's a treasure that God has put there. We don't want to be beggars. We want to be lenders. Mining the deep sea is a technologically complex and financially costly endeavor. Companies have already invested millions of dollars into exploration, despite the government saying there's no guarantee of mining going ahead. We have just left the port from Rarotonga, and we are heading to the Anua Anua Moana, which is the deep sea research vessel owned by one of the three companies that currently have an exploration license for deep sea mining in the islands. This is the back end of the ROV. How much uh, does this ROV cost? Um, millions, about three, three, four million dollars. This was taken um, about six weeks ago, six, eight oh. weeks ago. Wow. How deep is this? 5,098 meters. And how much footage do you have? Uh, we have about 20 hours so far. And how, how much of the footage is just like endless this. nodules? All of it. All of it. All of it. Just endless nodules. I mean, it's almost dizzying. You said earlier that the aim of the science that you're conducting or sponsoring is to essentially prove your assumption that it is environmentally and economically viable. Correct. Does that not then put the objectivity of the science into question if you're going into it with an assumption and aiming to prove that? Well, I think if you look at anything, you know, why do we do anything? We, deal, we do it because there's an objective at the end. Those against the industry face an uphill battle. Alana Smith is the president of Te Ipukarea Society, which has been fighting deep sea mining for years. She believes that education is key. Sometimes we don't talk about our deep sea too often because we don't visit that space very much. But this is a space that the deep sea mining activity will be doing a lot more work in. Why are we doing this mining? For our phones, yeah. For our phones, for solar power. Cars, well done, electric cars. It's the whole transition into the green energy that the world is wanting to go in towards. Can we extract these nodules sustainably. At what cost? At what cost will it be to our environment? I'd be interested to know what you are currently thinking. So it, it's up to you and your group discussion. Are you for or against? Who do you guys represent? <laughs> the youth. <laughs> yeah. And what did the youth think? Uh, the youth think that it's important to keep our oceans safe because it's a representation of who we are. How do the oceans represent who you are? So we rely on the ocean to harvest fish and to voyage across to the other islands. You think deep sea mining might hurt that? Yeah. What do you think the people of the Cook Islands think about seabed mining right now? I would say the people of the Cook Islands, it's a 50-50 split decision at the moment and that could come down to maybe they feel they're not informed enough to make a decision um, which is fair because we don't have enough information out there uh, to begin with to inform our people. It's so tough to battle against money and companies that are pumping money into the community. We've just come out of COVID which was a really hard two years um, for our people and the economy uh, so it is almost like the perfect timing 
for that sort of activity to be uh, seen within our community. Dr. Tana Rongo is a marine biologist who's worried that deep sea mining would lead to more development that would only further stress the local environment. He's been fighting against the impacts of human activity on the ocean for years. Excess nutrients in the water have led to outbreaks of crown of thorn starfish, which eat and destroy coral reefs. So right now we're gearing up to go down. Dr. Thanarongo, do you want to explain what we're about to do? So we're about to jump in and uh, look for, uh, for eradicate, remove the crown of thorn starfish, which is a problem here, killing all our corals. This is what we use um, to remove the crown of thorns from the reef. You basically, it's a hook. You basically put this underneath the crown of thorn that's sitting on the coral and you turn and it'll be right in the mouth of the crown of thorn and so you remove them that way. Then we have a, a string to string them up. Oh my gosh, whales everywhere! And we were just out here to go on a dive to get rid of crown of thorns. It's a nice little unexpected whale stop. <laughs> <laughs> 